Arkev. Yeah, what? So uh, we got it as a, a product of two power series. Uh, for one was that for two n minus k and one for f of uh, k. Correct. Yes. And uh, you remember how we did it, right? Yes, yes, as the uh, product of, uh, I mean, there was that rule for the product. Correct. So now, um, like, uh, as we discussed earlier also, like, given on the condition and given on how the function looks like, we'll decide which kind of generating function do we have to use? Either we want to use the ordinary generating function for the power series, or you want to use the exponential, exponential type generating function for the power series, formal power series, okay? So, and uh, in earlier lectures, once we discussed about how analytic we can see these formal power series and what information can we extract? Like how we had, remember, we computed the sum of squares of first n natural numbers. Yes. You guys have to continuously speak up when you can hear. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, am I not audible when I'm speaking? Hello? Yeah. Okay. So, this way, um, like today we will see how more analytic properties can be what more uh, analytic uh, uh, like entire analysis of those formal power series can be done in the sense of, I guess, uh, Riddhiman was more interested in, or um, yeah, to see if these series would actually converge or not converge, what happens if they're not converging, can we still work with them, etc. So those are the questions which we'll answer today. Okay. okay. They'll come up later in the course again like uh, towards possibly the end of the course, but today we'll uh, do the analytic theory for these power series. Yeah? Okay. So um, as we have seen, we always kept manipulating the recurrence relations and then we solved those equations. Either we had to use some partial fractions or some known series which we knew and we like, you know, we put the values for the coefficients. Yes. Today we'll see when all of this is actually doable in the sense like we cannot really explicitly compute the coefficients, but still we can talk a lot about what really, what is the kind of nature and how big or small they are, how fast they would converge to infinity or zero, things like that. Ultimately, that's what analysis of uh, sequence is, right? Right. So to start with, we were worried, what if they do not converge? Let's say if they do converge, what do we do? If they converge, then there has to be some radius of convergence. Yes. Both of you have had a course in complex analysis earlier? No, no. Huh? I have, I mean, uh, real analysis, I have uh, had a course and uh... you people understand what complex numbers are? Yes, ma'am. And when you are dealing with an analytic function or a complex function, then there is something called a radius of convergence for that function. Yeah, it is the uh, largest, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the set of numbers where the series converges, largest such uh, uh, disk. Correct. So as 
as the name itself says, we are talking about the radius and not just any number. So in the radius, we are actually looking for the largest enough radius for which the formed disk has all the values where the function would converge. Okay. Sam, you're also familiar with these concepts? Yes. I forgot what, uh, what uh, this is. Like you are MS or? No, no, I'm BSC second year. Okay, so from CMI, right? Yes. So you would have anyway seen this. Uh, not complex analysis, but we did do that in real analysis. So you are familiar with the radius of convergence, etc. Yes, ma'am. You would have seen Cauchy's formula earlier. Yes. Great. So at least uh, that's. Ma'am, Cauchy, ma Cauchy demand uh, identity that. Uh, Okay. Like uh, D uh, U D X. Oh, not D, that. U. But um, but along the same lines, like uh, when you are dealing with a complex function, there is a way to write it in terms of integral, Cauchy's integral formula. Uh, Something with one, one by two pi. Correct. Yeah. That's the one. Uh, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that one? But not uh, like very hard to grasp. Maybe like just within five ten minutes from Google, you can look it up and it should be fine. Okay. Uh, ma'am, in uh, uh, in the Cauchy integral formula, what is the c? Like one by two pi i integral over c. One by two pi i. And uh, I mean that is the sort of you say um, normalizing factor. And then oh. you have integration of the main function, which is the fz dz over z raised to n plus one. So generally this power, which I said for the z, is the, um, is the multiplicity of the singularity. But since here, you do not have to really worry about all those things. For here, I will say what I am treating as the value, and we just stick to that. It's better if you know the Cauchy's integral formula, but even if you don't, not a big deal. Okay. All right. So, so where are we? Yeah, radius of convergence. So radius of convergence is the largest number with which when you form the disk, the function is convergent for all the values inside this disk and it is divergent for all the values outside this disk. And when I say outside, I mean the values which has mod z bigger than r, okay? So there are two types of for disk. Whenever we talk about disk, in this course, we will mean the open disk. So points of the disk are mod z less than r, okay? Points on the circle of, the, of this disk are mod z equals r and outside are actually, though it's a abuse of notation, but we just call it outside, although outside would include mod z equals r and greater than r, right? Yeah. But on the circle is mod z equals r. Inside the disk is mod z less than r. Everything else we just say outside r. Okay. So we have a result which says that I would really appreciate if you can write this down in your copies also so that you have it for records. Yeah, with me so far? Uh, what is the result you wanted to uh, wanted us to write? Sorry, I, uh, are yeah, you I uh, sharing anything? I, we can't see, at least no, I can't. I did not share, I will speak and you write in your side. Okay, yes, 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 yes. So to talk about the radius of convergence for a complex function, there exists a number r 
which would lie anywhere between 0 to infinity, both inclusive, that is called as the radius of convergence for the series F. And now this has a property that for all the values of Z, where mod Z is less than R, which means it's lying inside the disk of radius R, the series converges, the series F, which we are talking about. So maybe on top you can, for your reference, say F Z is equal to summation A and Z raised to N, summation starting from N equals zero. Okay. So far we had always been using X, right? Yeah. We just shifted to Z now so that in your head subconsciously you know that we are now talking about things which complex remains number. valid even in the complex structure. Okay. okay. Yeah. So <laughs> the series <laughs> F converges for all the values with mod Z less than R and diverges for all the values of Z where mod Z is bigger than R. Okay, so this okay. is the radius of convergence of the series F. And now this R can be written in terms of the coefficients of the sequence. And okay. this expression is, R is expressed as the reciprocal of limb sup of nth root of mod an. It's the uh, supremum, limit supremum. Uh, yes, yes. Limb sup is limit supremum. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, can you repeat uh, li uh, one over limit supremum? Of the, you take nth root of the mod a n. Modulus okay. value of a n. The both of you are familiar with the limb soup concept? Yes, ma'am. So um, then you obviously know that limb soup can be infinity as well. Yes. And of course it can be zero. Okay. I mean, anything can be zero, but the radius of convergence to be more precise can be anywhere between zero to infinity, both inclusive. Yeah, if it does not converge, if the series does not converge anywhere, we say that the radius of convergence is zero. If it is convergent for every value, the radius of convergence would be infinity, infinity. right? So just to recall the limb soap actually has uh, like can be defined as like if the, <coughs> if this number is finite, then for every uh, positive epsilon, all but finitely many, mem uh, finitely many members of the sequence are less than L plus epsilon, which means only a finitely many members are larger than L plus epsilon, where L is the number that I'm calling as limb soap of a sequence. So if an is some sequence and I'm interested in finding its limit superior, let's say the limit superior of an is L, then we are talking about the properties or like how you would really define the L. So it says that every positive epsilon, only finitely many values of this sequence can be larger than L plus epsilon. And infinitely many values of this sequence have to be larger than L minus epsilon. So you see the bracket L minus epsilon to L plus epsilon contains the infinitely many values. Oh, yeah, right. right? You can have infinitely many values even below L minus epsilon, but that's not what you're interested in because you're finding limit superior. Okay, so yeah. we are interested in the sup side, which is the supremum side, right? 
and if l happens to be plus infinity then this says that no matter what positive value you choose alpha there is at least one member of the sequence which is bigger than this alpha on contrary if l happens to be minus infinity then for every x there are only finitely many co coefficients which are bigger than x okay yeah which means more and more points are approaching towards minus infinity okay yeah. so some really nice properties which this concept enjoys is that if you take the sequence of real numbers any sequence you take it has to have a limit superior and it has only one limit superior you may not find the limit superior in the real number system but you always have a limit superior value in the extended real number system in the extended we mean minus infinity and plus infinity are included okay, right. okay? yeah also if a sequence has a limit not every sequence has a limit right not every sequence we can be convergent but no. every sequence does have a limit superior so in case the limit exists for the sequence then the limit and the limit superior both happens to be same all right okay this is actually from real analysis i i am not very sure if like you this all is resonating well with you guys or not no i'm okay yeah, i i i am getting it great ridhiman yes i said uh, it's okay with me okay nice and then just to get the flavor of the term supremum in this what we can see is that if you take the set of cluster points of the sequence which means the limit points okay then yeah. limb sup value is nothing but the least upper bound of this set so limb sup of a sequence is the lub of the set of its cluster points okay yeah so that way you can like now very easily formulate what a limb inf would be take the cluster points and then you take the greatest lower bound right yes and that gives you the limb inf but that's a different story we are not interested in that right now but just on the contrast okay yeah okay so the theorem which we just stated its proof is anyways there in the book so you can read it up i will not spend time on that proof let's come to the next result if you guys have the pdf maybe you can open the pdf for a better understanding of what i'm saying chapter 2 so um i am on 2.4 right yeah section 2.4 that's right yes got it so page number 47 of the book theorem 2.4.2 yeah yeah so after we have talked about how radius of convergence of a series is related Uh, in the sense like how that gives the convergence and divergence of the series and then how it is related with the coefficients of the series we have the next result for this kind of functions which says that if you have a power series a and z n which converges for all z in the radius of convergence and if fz denotes the sum which means fz is the summation a and z n 
then fz is an analytic function and is mod z less than r which we already know if you are calling fz to be its sum then fz is an analytic function inside the disk analytic function means which does not have any singularities okay furthermore if the series diverges for mod z bigger than r then the function fz must have at least one singularity on the circle of convergence so this later part is what is more interesting so as it's already written that a power series keeps on converging until something stops it and what that something can be a singularity of the function right so singularity is where the function autumn like all of a sudden becomes undefined so okay. uh, that singularity will uh, must be on the circle of convergence yes okay. not must be but like this is how see if not if this was not on the circle you could have extended the circle uh, like the radius a little okay, bit okay right right yeah yeah i got it yes. so uh, the, man i didn't get this part like there's no singularity on the circumference we can take okay a, so let's why can let's we take see let's see this in the intuitive way so let's say you start let's say there is a function which has a radius of convergence as 10 okay yeah so this radius of convergence as 10 which means from origin you are seeing the disk with radius 10 right right now from this uh, for this particular function if i stand at origin and i draw a circle of radius 2 and i look at all the points inside this disk inside this circle okay this is a disk with the radius 2 so function would converge for all these values here yes right okay so good enough so far now let's say i draw a circle with radius equals 3 then also uh, the same will happen great now i shift to radius r equals 10 or not 10 let's say 9 yeah then also it will be the same everything inside will converge till anything which you have hit at 10 everything will remain the same yes if i draw the circle with <clears throat> radius equals 10 and look at all the points inside this disk the function converges Yes. At every point inside this disk, right, Saham? We are taking the integer of the disk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Integer. Oh. We are taking oh. the open disk. Oh, so it will come. Okay. So till ten, we are fine. Yes. You understood the argument till ten? Yes. Now. if let's say there is no singularity on the circle of the convergence which means a function is converging for every point on the radius of convergence uh, on the circle of the convergence is that right yes yes now for all of these points on the circle of the convergence you can draw very <coughs> small disks yes and that is my question that why is it that in the small disk they should exist no all of them must be so um this is this is <coughs> through basic uh, um complex analysis that whenever a function converges it converges for in a small neighborhood if it is converges converging at a point then it converges for all the values in a small neighborhood 
of that point. So that's why for all the points on the circle of the convergence, <clears throat> you can draw small disk around each of these points. We are okay, not really interested in finding out how small or big circles can we draw. Okay, ma'am. But then um, uh, it is not necessary that all points on this uh, on uh, this disk uh, are uh, the series does not converge for them. That is the assumption which we take. That's what we are uh, starting with. If it if it is having even one point of uh, divergence on the circle of convergence, we are anyway done. No. No, ma'am, but that uh, if, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if in, in there exists some open set in which all points converge, then no point on the boundary can have such an open set because it is also a limit point of the complement of the disk. So that would mean that uh, no, uh, the function does not converge for any point on the boundary. But I don't think that is true. Can you Maybe type in the chat box? Your voice is not very clear to me. Okay, so I'm sorry, ma'am. This is on the boundary of the disk. As in? No, if we take a point on the boundary of this open disk. Right. Boundary of the cannot... disk is the circle of the convergence. Uh -huh, that is the, the set of points is... mod z equals r. Yes, ma'am. But then that then we cannot construct a uh, open ball which is uh, which does not intersect the complement of the disk. Correct. So that would mean that it is not uh, convergent itself if, uh, if uh, uh, by going by the previous result. The main point here is that as we said so these two results, if you see, they are like, you know, rephrasement of each other. Hmm. What it really implies, as you have correctly pointed out, that if you see from the previous result, it tells me that when I start, when I, When I start my, uh, when I start from inside of the disk of my convergence, I keep on going outside, outside, outside till something stops me. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. And the previous result, which I stated already says that radius of convergence is something such that inside that disk, it's always convergent and for points, hmm such that mod z is strictly bigger than r, it is divergent, yes, right? But what really happens on mod z equals r is not coming from this. So the no, next but... result is nothing but strengthening of this result. And it says that, see, it's not like a points on the radius of convergence, circle of convergence, are nice. No, the singularity starts popping on the circle of convergence itself. No, no, I doubt my, uh, I was claiming that if uh, some point is on the radius uh, on the circle, then it must be a singularity. So you're saying every point on the circle should be a singularity? Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
So all points on the circle need not be a singularity because uh, in in a certain direction uh, uh, there can be points uh, where uh, it converges. We are only uh, 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 taking R to be the largest, largest. circle in uh, inside which everything converges. So uh, if uh, by definition uh, the uh, the uh, that circle must have at least one such point uh, where uh, that converging thing breaks. But that doesn't necessarily mean that all the points on the circle in all directions, uh, if we go across the uh, radius, uh, across that circle, uh, we will have to converge, right? Uh, that is yes, right. but, uh -huh, but uh, I thought, uh, man, uh, you said a few minutes ago, I think that uh, if, it, uh, if uh, at some point the series convergence, we can take an open set around it in which the series also converges. So that is that is on the contrary, uh, Sam. When we assume that every point on the circle of convergence is a nice point, in such a case, we are doing that. You at least agree with me if I say that if you are looking at any point of convergence, then you can draw a radius around, uh, like it, there exists some, some positive epsilon such that a disk around that point of radius epsilon will be a disk where or where the function would converge for all the values. Yes, and this is um, if this is true, then I'm, then won't it also be that for all points on the boundary it does not converge? That's precisely what we are also saying. See, I am not claiming that it has to diverge for all the points on the circle of convergence. What we are really saying is that the circle of convergence itself has at least one point of divergence for the series F. Uh, Ma'am, you are saying for at least one point it diverges. I am thinking that for all points it diverges. No, because see, as Ridhiman just told, we are looking no, at no. the radius of the convergence. We no, are not really is... looking at the region in which it converges. No, ma'am, I understood that part. Mm -hmm. But uh, I cannot uh, relate this uh, uh, logic with the logic that if it converges at some point, then there's an open set around it in which it converges. Okay, let's talk on this after the lecture. Okay, ma'am. Okay, we'll discuss this one on one after this. Okay. okay. But um, I mean, to see a very quick proof, way is that since if you assume on the contrary that uh, every point on the circle of convergence, the series would con excuse me, converge, then you can draw small balls around those points and then. Heine Bodel theorem will tell you that only a finite number of these disks are needed to cover the entire circle instead of these infinitely many disks. And then you take those many and you can increase the radius of convergence to a larger one, which is a contradiction to the definition of radius of convergence. So that was a quick proof for this. But anyway, um, Saham, we will discuss about this later also and get ourselves convinced. Now, just uh, to see these applications or to really get the feel of what these convergence divergence is, if you look at the series summation Z raised to N, then even in our sleeping mind, we know that this series converges if mod Z is less than one and diverges for mod Z bigger than one, yeah. right? So we can clearly say that the radius of convergence has to be one, right? Yeah. And so function anyway, now you know the radius of convergence is one and since the uh, singularity, at least one singularity appears on boundary z equals one, you can take the function to be one upon one minus z. 
which indeed is the function, right? We have done this so many times by now. Okay, second example is the function fz equals one upon two minus e raised to z. When will this function have a divergence? When is this not convergent? So we are always uh, dealing with the, uh, you know, whatever, although whenever we talk about series, we talk about, uh, uh, you can expand them about any point, but here in this particular course, since the main motive which we started off was these as a formal power series and not really the power series. <coughs> Ma'am, can I ask a quick question? Just a uh... <coughs> Uh, one, could I ask a question? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in a radius of convergence, does it yeah. mean that anything outside that for it, it does not convert? Or... No, no, no. Uh, uh, for the radius of convergence, uh, that is the largest such circle uh, inside which everything converges, as far as I know. Uh, about okay. uh, the about things outside, uh, it uh, it may converge or diverge, if I'm right. Uh, Oh, okay. I think we should. Uh, I think uh, we should clarify it from um, once. I'm not very sure, but okay. Thanks. Huh, sorry. <clears throat> yeah, uh, sorry. Um, Zaham, you were asking something. Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, I was asking outside the radius of convergence whether uh, the series can converge or not. So, as far as the course on complex analysis goes, it's always that when you deal with a complex function, the radius of convergence is such that for the values, for the points inside the disk, it's always convergent. And for points outside this disk, including the circle of convergence, it may converge, it may not converge. But one thing is for sure that there is always at least one singularity on the circle of convergence. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. But then I understood. Uh, that is for sure. Be. Because yeah. otherwise you yeah. could have taken a larger radius of convergence. Okay. 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 Then, ma uh, yeah. uh, and ma'am, I was asking something else. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, before today we had been seeing those series uh, with uh, real values only and from today uh, and using those as generating functions we were uh, solving uh, combinatorial problems and stuff like that. So uh, I was asking that, uh, can we use these uh, complex numbered uh, series to solve combinatorial uh, problems also, or are we studying this just for the uh, sake of uh, studying these analytic uh, functions? Or... So currently we are dealing with this for the sake of analytic uh, discussion of these uh, series. But okay. this is uh, this would be wrong if I say that you cannot use or rather the complex series will not be of any aid if you're trying to solve com uh, combinatorial identities. That is incorrect. Okay, okay. Okay. We will be seeing such applications in this course, right? Uh, should come, should come, yes. Okay, okay, Depends okay. on time and all. But okay, this okay, is, okay. I mean, compared to the real valued uh, power series, complex uh, valued power series are less into the fashion or like uh, they are harder to appear in the applications, but they do okay. appear. That is for sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because many a times it would happen or it may happen that whatever data you have, you may not be able to, you know, translate it into the form of a power series when you're dealing with just the real numbers, but it turns out beautifully with the complex numbers. Okay, yeah. So I should look this up and if I find very straight away pointers, I will send in the group. Okay, okay. But they do appear. 
Okay. Let me just take a note of this. <clears throat> and I know I have received your assignments. You should get back the graded assignments in a couple of days. Okay, and since there has not been any lecture actually in the last week, so um, the next assignment I would release around maybe after next Wednesday's class. Okay. Okay. And the next class when Aglan is also there, we'll discuss time for the okay. extra lectures which I have to take. We have missed three lectures so far, right? Okay. So we we'll schedule them. Let's see. I mean, if uh, Saturday Sundays work with you people, maybe one of the Saturday Sundays, or I can stretch the Wednesday Fridays lectures to two hours or two and a half hours and cover the material accordingly. Saturday Sunday, you mean uh, tomorrow and day after tomorrow, or the not next this weekend? weekend. Okay. The next weekend onwards. Uh, okay. I'll have some problems with uh, Saturday. Okay, and Sundays? Sundays are, uh, they are uh, open as of now. Okay, the same with you, Ridhiman? Yes. All right. So we'll see if uh, Sunday works for Agilan also, then we'll come to a common time slot and then we can okay, yeah. keep this. And uh, in like no matter what, like we'll anyway... Uh, extend the scheduled lectures by a little longer as we had been doing so far. <laughs> okay. Okay, no problem. And uh, ma'am, are you are you uploading the uh, record video recordings of the lectures? I mean. Yeah, yeah, they're there. They are there on the YouTube. Two lectures are not there because one day we didn't. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, uh, where is I? I mean, I didn't get the link for the. Uh, I have true. mentioned the link for the. Um, oh, 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 yeah, got it, got it. Yeah, it's in the, for the playlist that's itself. Okay, okay, yeah. Right. So, okay. right after the lecture ends, I upload it there. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, got it. Okay. Yeah. So, today also I'll be doing the same, but I mean, yeah. it's really unfortunate that my eye, like my yeah. tablet, is not getting detected. So, you guys have to just hear and try to understand what I'm explaining. Okay. So coming back to the discussion, if we take the function fz equals one upon two minus e raised to z, the reciprocal of two minus e raised to z, then <clears throat> if we talk about expanding this uh, series about z equals zero, what can you expect to be the radius of convergence? Well, log two, taking uh, e to the z equal to two. Correct. Because the first obvious point where this function would become undefined or have a singularity is when the denominator becomes zero. Zero. Yeah. And denominator becomes zero when e raised to z is two. And e raised to z is two precisely when z is equals to log two. Okay? Yes. So, what are all the points when e raised to z is 2? Now, <laughs> remember that you're not really in the real line, but actually in the complex line. Yes. Uh, so all the points that are going to give me the value e raised to z equals 2 are z equals log 2 plus 2k pi i for integers k. i is the iota, square root of minus 1. Yeah. Okay. These are two pi periodic. Everyone knows that. Yeah. So keep on taking rounds around this uh, line and you keep hitting back the same point. So log 2 plus 2k pi i. These are all the points for which e raised to z will be 2. Now, yeah. since we are interested in the radius of convergence, we will have to look for the largest r away from origin 
such that I don't hit any singularity, which means I have to choose among these points Z, the one which is closest to the origin. And closest to the origin is hit when K is zero. So in the log two plus two K pi I, if you take K to be zero, log two is the nearest, correct? Uh, just a minute, how are you uh, so sure that k equal to zero will give the nearest point? Uh, if you take k equals one, you are moving uh, away from zero. No? Uh, uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, and, uh, and if you take k equals negative. minus one in the negative oh, direction, yeah, that's but it's the, the same point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, it's right. just the reflection about the yeah. iota line. Yes, yeah. right. Okay. Okay, Saham. So since today, you know, I am not writing and showing, I am not so sure if things are visible to you. Yeah, it's fine till now. Maybe I can, uh, yeah, maybe this would be better. I can share the book PDF, right? And then you can share, see directly on the screen. Yeah, you can do that. Let's do that. Yeah, is no, this visible? Yes. So this no, is the example PMI. which we are dealing with. Okay, the function fz. Is my pointer also visible? Yes, it's visible. Nice. So this we have already figured out. So the radius of convergence is log 2. Okay, so as we already said that if Fz is given to you, then the best way to find the radius of convergence of this power series is about mm -hmm. like for the expansions about the origin. Remember for the origin is what you have this. If you take uh, expansion around some other point, then the entire theory changes because then you will have to write fz in terms of a power series which will have instead of z raised to n z minus z not raised to n remember that entire theory yes. taylor series yes so here since fz you are going to write in terms of uh, where is this in this form so this is nothing but expansion about zero. Okay. Yes. That's why when you are doing the expansion about zero, it is really nice to figure out what this would be. You just see what is the point nearest to the origin where this denominator would vanish. And that particular point gives you the radius of convergence. Okay. Yes. Next example, little, little interesting example is Z upon E raised to Z minus one. With initial condition, F of zero is equals to one. Now this asks me not to really find the uh, coefficients, but the size of the coefficients of its power series. So by size, it, it really is asking me to find how large or small or asymptotically small these coefficients are. Okay. okay. And all this I have to try to do just from the analyticity of this particular function. Okay. So this I know is a function which is analytic everywhere except possibly at points when e raised to z becomes one. One, yeah, like zero. Like e raised to, not zero, e raised to Yeah, I'll define that. Yeah. But all those points, I mean, 2k pi i. Yeah. Correct. But if you take the one which is nearest to origin, it is going to be z equals zero. Yes. Correct. But at f 
of z equals zero is given to be one. So and yes, that is also the limit uh, at z tends to zero, which is also the limit. So that is not a singularity, correct? Right. Everyone knows the L'Hopital's rule because yes. at z equals zero, you you see that this is also zero and this is also zero. So you differentiate this and this. So you'll have one upon e raised to z, and then you substitute z equals zero, you get one, right? So you actually get f of zero is equal to one, and therefore this singularity was a removable singularity, and hence not a singularity which we are concerned about. So what is the next singularity from here? Yeah, please, both of you. 2 pi i. 2 pi i, which means you take for the integer k equals 1. 1. Or equality, you could have taken k minus. equals minus 1. Not an issue. But since we are always interested in mod z, even if I take minus 1, it's going to come down to 2 pi i. Yes. Okay. So this is the one which is nearest to the origin. Right. Now with this, this power series, if you were ex expanding it at around the origin, this is what you would have written a and z raised to n. And then these a n's is whose size we have to estimate. Right. This is the question. Estimate the size of the coefficients of its power series about the original. This is this power series. And yeah. about the origin, when I expand it, this is what I would get. So these are the coefficients whose size I have to estimate. Right? right. So at least first thing which I can see is that the radius of convergence is 2 pi. Because the first point where I hit a singularity is 2 pi i. OK? Yes. Yeah. So the real number which corresponds to 2 pi i point on my complex plane is nothing but 2 pi. Yes, that is the radius. You know? Now, to estimate the sizes, okay, so everyone remembered this radius of convergence was nothing but the reciprocal of nth root of the limb soup. Yeah. So if radius of convergence is 2 pi, this limb soup of modulus a n 1 raised to n 1 by n is 1 by 2 pi. 1 by 2 pi. All that trivial computation after yeah. you're done. So you get that this limb soup is 1 upon 2 pi. Now then you do these uh, little computations slowly and from the like properties which we stated for the limb soup, you know that given any like a positive epsilon, this particular this is the sequence right for which the limb soup is being com computed. So this yes. almost all the va values are lying in this and this. Is that right? Remember these properties which I yes, stated yes. in the beginning? That only finitely many values can be beyond this particular limb soup value plus epsilon. And infinitely many values have to be larger than this number. So this interval, if you see around 1 upon 2 pi minus epsilon plus epsilon. So it's like from here to here, oh, I can't even write here. Okay, let's see. So if you see this bracket, one upon two pi minus epsilon, excuse my handwriting, huh? this is too bizarre. And one upon Plus, plus epsilon. Okay. Yeah. 
so infinitely many values have to exist in this particular range only finitely many values are here and there can be infinitely many values here but here only finitely many values are there okay and now so when you uh, just shift this uh, power what it really tells you in both of these sides is that so mod an is less than nth power of 1 by 2 pi plus epsilon and it is greater than nth power of this number right yeah. so this coefficient like this particular power is really an exponent so what you are really saying is that this number is no diff, no way, not very far from this number anyway and also both of these are raised to n correct so these coefficients a n of the series particularly decrease to zero very fast in particular they decrease to zero exponentially fast and at what rate this is the rate with this particular power yeah but so far do you really know what your an is no all you know that is for sufficiently sufficiently large n an converges to <clears throat> something in this particular bracket but we do not know what this value is still we know that ans are degrading exponentially to the value zero <coughs> okay so <clears throat> you saw how powerful this is like even without knowing what these coefficients are just from the series which we start oh is this going to stick here we just started with this much information right that is all nothing else and we have arrived at this conclusion that the coefficient of the series decreased to zero exponentially fast we are even able to tell you the rate of this decay <clears throat> okay but whatever we did here was this any specific to this particular sequence or like this particular power series which we started with was it any particular about this yeah the 1 by 2 pi came from uh, this function okay 1 by 2 pi came because of this value this radius but of whatever the area. we did for this can this be done in general yeah in that case the radius of convergence will be different correct so that is what we record here so if fz is the power series a and zn and this be analytic in some region containing the origin and a singularity of fz of smallest modulus be at z0 okay so mod z0 defines the radius of convergence then smallest modulus okay remember this is how we were finding the radius of convergence look at the point nearest to origin at which the function fails to be analytic so singularity of fz of smallest modulus is at the point z0 so z0 is nothing but the radius of convergence for this fz and then you take epsilon to be positive number then you have an n such that for every large enough n mod of an is going to be less than this and bigger than this okay yeah this is nothing but the same like you have mimicked the entire construction yeah so great 
so um, this is all about like examples which we wanted to see for this and we'll see more of such things later in the fifth chapter now some more analysis <clears throat> or maybe i can skip this how much time five ten minutes left okay let let's just go through this quickly and then we'll have few um few power series and then i'll stop maybe okay 25 minutes more good with you people yes nice so so this is the cauchy's integral formula which i was talking about so if you take uh, the fz to be summation an z raised to n then an can be written as this particular integral with the normalizing factor 1 upon 2 pi i okay so this is the expression for the nth coefficient of the taylor series expansion now this uh, so this is around a contour and now this contour could have been any simple closed curve which encloses the origin since this this is written for the expansion around the origin so this entire theory is also like the contour along which you are going to integrate the function this particular function inside one is also has to be something which encloses the origin and it has to lie entirely in the region where this function fz is analytic all the what you would really expect okay intuitively what you're expecting is what you have so far so you can then write that excuse me now in the limsu format if you would go you are really taking the max of mod z equals r where r is something in between 0 to r where r was the radius of convergence of the series okay so till like till the uh, maximum possible where you can hit is what you're taking as mr and then r is to n just corresponds to this so um maybe i not very maybe skip this we'll we'll cover this later on i mean right now it's useless to go into this what is another interesting part for these uh, power series functions is that sometimes you would have noticed that you know out of a power series you want to extract only the even powers or the odd powers right and we do that with the trick you take f of x you take f of minus x you add them up divide by 2 so this collects all the even terms of the um power series fx right uh yes if you have not done this in past just do it like it really takes half a minute and you will have confidence in yourself yeah done yeah i mean uh, for the even one I, I got it, and for the so what is really happening when you take minus x, you the even yeah the powers, even power terms get cancelled, and uh, in the odd uh, odd case that odd uh, term powers gets cancelled here because you would have x raised to n and minus one raised to n. So when n is even here, then the f of x and f of minus x. they are same for n even so you get 2 to uh, you know you get a to n a to n two times if n is even a n a n appears twice in this sum and you then divide by 2 so ultimately there is just one a n left
Understood what I'm saying? Yeah. Just substitute the value in the fx equals uh, summation a n x n. And similarly, if you take the difference fx and minus f of minus x, <coughs> hmm, then this is the reverse of this. So then odd powers, which came with a minus one raised to something for the odd values. And then with this minus, it really becomes a plus here. So then odd terms gets collected twice and then you divide by two. So this was when you were trying to extract just the even powers or just the odd powers. But can this be extend, extended a little further? So what we're really asking is that, can we really find the uh, just those coefficients which are, which are coefficients of the x raised to 3n, let's say? So I would want to find I would want to collect all the coefficients for x raised to 0, x raised to 3, x raised to 6. This one collected me coefficients x raised to 0, x raised to 2, x raised to 4, x raised to 6 and so on. This one collected the coefficients x raised to 1, x raised to 3, x raised to 5 and so on. Now I am extending this and asking if I can do this and find the coefficients for x raised to 0, x raised to 3, x raised to 6, or x raised to 0, x raised to 4, x raised to 8. So if you take the powers of x in some AP, can I find the values? Can I find collect the coefficients for just those powers? That is the next question. And answer is yes, we can certainly do it. How will we do it? We'll see now. Okay, so formally, this is what we want to answer. So if gx is summation x raised to 3n over 3n factorial, instead of n, I only want to collect the coefficients of x raised to 3n, n factorial. So this is an exponential generating function, if you would have noticed, not an ordinary one. Right, Saham? Okay, so what was really <clears throat> making this thing special is this property that if you take one raised to n plus minus one raised to n divided by two, this is one only when n is even and it's zero if n is odd. So this way you were extracting the different coefficients, coefficients of different powers, right? And this one and minus one, what is special about them? X square minus one. So you have here and here, right? So what is special about these powers? Uh, sorry, yeah, these are square roots of one. These are square roots of one. So oh, if yeah. I had to find just the uh, squares, uh, I mean, the coefficient which were coming at x raised to 2, x raised to 4, etc. At a gap of 2, we had to look at square roots. If I have to look for the coefficients of x raised to those powers which are at a distance of 3, I will have to look for cube roots. Yes. The number 1 or, or for that matter, every number can have nth roots. Yeah. So now we'll deal with the cube roots of unity. Let's say these cube roots are 1, omega 1, omega 2. Okay? Yeah. What are omega 1, omega 2? You people already know. I will not Omega and that. omega squared. And for our matter, it's not even relevant. What is really relevant is that we know the cube roots of unity. One of them is definitely one. Other ones are omega one, omega two. Okay. And then they also have satisfy the similar property, which is that one raised to n plus omega one raised to n plus omega two raised to n 
whole divided by 3 is 1 only when 3 divides n, which means n is a multiple of 3 and it's going to be 0 otherwise. Yeah. In contrast to this particular relation. Okay. Yeah. So, following this, what we now know is that f of x, if you take f of omega 1x, you take and f of omega 2x, you take, you add all of them up and then divide by 3. What you're going to get is collect the coefficients of x raised to 3r. Okay. This is what we did here, right? Yes. So this x comes with a multiple 1. This x comes with a multiple minus 1. Those were the two roots, square roots of unity. Now, when you're dealing with cube roots of unity, the roots being 1, omega 1, and omega 2, you take f, x with multipli multiplier 1, x with multiplier omega 1, x with multiplier omega 2. Add them up, divide by 3. What you have done is collected the coefficients of third powers of x. Now you already know what omega 1 and omega 2 are. You can substitute these values back. And then this gx is 1 upon 3 e raised to x, e raised to omega 1x, and e raised to omega 2x. Now this, with these values, you would substitute back here and get this answer. Okay. This part is yours. I'm not going to go into this piece. But uh, what... so is there a way uh, for us to find, uh, suppose, the uh, uh, congruent to one modulo three, those kind of numbers? Like if, I mean, yeah, we will have to do some more hard work, but okay. certainly we should be able to. We will have to find correct relations here such that it would be one if n is uh, congruent to 3 modulo 1, n is congruent to 1 modulo 3, n is congruent to 2 modulo 3. So those relations you have to find here. Okay. In the case of square root, this was easy. Easy, yeah. That is where like you could uh, in one shot do this. Yeah. yeah. But for this you will have to, yeah, you will have to expand this particular bracket and uh, do it if it is like what really happens if, uh, you know, n is congruent to 0 mod 3, n is congruent to 1 mod 3, n is congruent to 2 mod 3. Now, wouldn't it be easier to uh, take the generating function a1, a2? Sorry? Instead of taking some a0, a1, uh, a0 plus a1x plus a2x plus squared, we could take the generating function a1 plus a2x plus uh, a3x squared and so on. And uh, then you would uh, get the uh, for mod one. I still didn't understand what you said. Uh, Ma'am, if you are trying to find the generating function for uh, the terms of this, which are congruent to one mod three, uh, if the original. We are not really interested in finding the generating function as such, Saham. What we're really interested is in finding the coefficient itself. So if we can, uh, like as a shortcut, if we can find this particular function, then we are through. Because here the coefficients are nothing but, I mean, the coefficients for this particular series are exactly the coefficients which we are interested in. We are not interested in finding the generating functions for the separate uh, I am not sure if I understood your question correctly. Isn't this what you are asking? Uh, Ma'am, what is our aim in doing this? Uh, in case uh, hmm? What is the aim in doing this? Uh, aim in doing this is that so many times you have to collect some particular coefficients out of a power series. Hmm. And you do not want to do the entire computation and then collect it. So, for instance, like, um, let's say sine x uh, power series, if you look at, or cos x power series you look at, they do not even involve all the 
powers of x right they have only the alternate powers so if i have information about only the alternate powers i do not really have to worry about the entire power series i could work with just that little information that i have and be done with my work so here this was the case when you were looking at just the alternate terms but if you want to extend this idea further next question would be instead of a uh, instead of trying to find the coefficients which are one distance apart can we do it if the coefficients are two distance apart which means coefficients of 3 raised to n or coefficients which are four distance apart three distance apart and so on Yes, sir. So we are obtaining a power series which generates these uh, terms with caps in them. So this is what this power series would be. Hmm. So uh, I I was asking, couldn't in the original power series if we took it uh, f x minus the constant term by s and then did this, you would get all the terms which are modulo. Uh, Which are congruent to one mod three. Zero yeah. mod three. Yes, in this method we would get zero mod three. But if mm -hmm. we were to take a one plus uh, a two x uh, a n times x to the power of n minus one, mm -hmm. if we took that as g and uh, sorry, if oh we okay, you are suggesting the... a method to find here, like what happens if I mean how to really come up with the yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah. That's that's supposedly what you're supposed to do. So it's actually a good exercise to sit down and try to figure out this entire table. Like, this is one when three divides n. What is this expression when n is congruent to one modulo three, or when n is congruent to two modulo three? can we come down to something as neat as this if not what are the difficulties what are the restrictions what are the obstructions and how we can deal with them okay so um this part you compute by yourself this is nothing but just putting uh, these two values making their expansions and then adding the things up to get something like this what we'll see next is here that if um, okay let us you guys can stare at it for a while and i'll be back just give me a minute
yeah so to see an application of what we have just achieved in the sense of this let's say we have to find this number lambda n which is given by minus 1 raised to k n choose 3k summation running from k equals 0 so what we are really being suggested is that see if we knew this particular function then this can be computed because this function is nothing but evaluating this particular series at the value minus 1. When you do minus 1 raised to 3k and then your summation is running on k, so this 3k you can like simply write as minus 1 raised to k and minus 1 raised to 2k. Right? This x raised to 3k, I can write as x raised to k times x raised to 2k. So x raised to 2k is x square raised to k. So when you take minus 1, x square becomes 1. So 1 raised to k goes away. What you're left with is minus 1 raised to k, which is exactly this. So this number is nothing but this particular power series is evaluated at x equals minus 1. But this is not a normal power series for me. This is picking out only the third oh, yeah. terms. But we now know what this is. So third term from which series really? If you remember the binomial expansion. Yeah, x plus 1 whole to the power n. Correct. So if you take capital Fx to be 1 plus x raised to n, this is picking up picking out every third term of this power series, this uh, binomial expansion, right? So yeah. fx is nothing but f of x, f of omega 1x. Why am I using the capital F here? Because f is picking out values from f, like every third value from this expansion, right? Just how here I had to pick out values from every third value from the expansion of f, I use the small f. Now I am extracting values from capital F. Where did it go? Capital F. So f of x is nothing but capital F of x, capital F of omega 1x, capital F of omega 2x, whole divided by 3. Right? So this entire thing is 1 plus x raised to n, 1 plus omega 1x raised to n, blah, blah, blah. Now, these things you evaluate at x equals minus 1. So lambda n, which is f of minus 1, takes, so this vanishes. 1 yes. plus minus 1. So you're left with just 1 minus x raised to n, sorry, 1 minus omega 1 raised to n plus 1 yes. minus omega, omega 2 raised to n, whole divided by 3. Now substitute back the values of omega 1 and omega 2. And you get the answer. Okay. So you see how easy it is. Like otherwise, at least I don't see a quick way to compute this particular number. But just the little observation that this is nothing but evaluating this particular series at x equals minus one. And then this particular series is nothing but every third term from this series within two lines, you have the answer. Okay. So this now I will do for the, whenever you want to find or pick every nth term. Okay. So for every R positive, the Rth roots of unity do the same sort of thing. Namely, you take R roots of unity, which are one omega one, omega two, and so on up till omega r minus 1. So omega r equals 1. So the unity 1 is also gets getting counted here itself. Okay. The summation is basically running over all the r roots of this unity. And then you divide by 1 by r. 
and then this is one only when r divides n and zero otherwise. So this left side, you know, what are the r roots of unity? Two pi i n, and then depending on which root you are looking at, so you have these r roots. So you take all these r roots, and you have this answer. So now this is a finite geometric series whose sum is quite easy to find, and this way. What you are really saying is that you can always find components that form and that appear in a arithmetic progression and which is some particular exercise. So that will go in your assignments. Now I have 10 more minutes. Let's quickly go through the powerful series which are very handy. Most of you, most of these you already know, and it's actually good to sit down and compute the, try to compute their <clears throat> radius of convergence. Okay. So basically, since I'm already, I as in, it's already written in the sense that they are being expanded around origin. The radius of convergence is also to be computed for that particular value. So everyone knows summation xn is nothing but 1 upon 1 minus x. Yes. Summation xn over n is log 1 over 1 minus x. e raised to x is x raised to n over n factorial. Sine x is this particular value. Right? All the odd terms you collect from this with the alternating signs. Cos x, you collect all alternating terms with even powers and negative, like alternating sign. This is basic uh, binomial expansion, which we have already done in our lecture or our course also. This is an expansion of this. Yeah. This is something new. These are Bernoulli numbers, which we have not studied. So for the sake of definition, this is how we define the Bernoulli numbers. So Bernoulli numbers are the coefficients of x raised to n over n factorial. Basically, Bernoulli numbers are the coefficients in the exponential generating function for the function x over e raised to x minus 1. Okay? So x raised to n over n factorial makes it a exponential formal power series, right? And then you have many more also. So depending on uh, which exercise you hit upon, these are some uh, handy power series, which you might have to, I mean, they'll hear you anywhere know all of these, right? These are few more. Cortex also, you know, and then x cortex. Okay. So now all these are expressed in the terms of Bernoulli numbers. Yeah. These are harmonic numbers. So this was there earlier. It had to go in your uh, assignment sheet. Everybody knows harmonic numbers, right? No, ma'am, I don't know. So just how you have natural numbers, one, two, three, four, harmonic numbers are one upon these numbers. So one oh, upon okay. one, one upon two, one upon three, like that. Okay. So there are a few problems relating to that. I'll put in the coming assignment. So, okay. Mm, yeah, so I already told, so B and are the Bernoulli numbers and they are defined through this particular equation itself. Okay. So Bernoulli numbers are defined using this equation itself. That became a circular logic. No. So whatever is the coefficient here is called the Bernoulli numbers. 
ओके ओके एंड देन अ फॉर्मल थ्योरी फॉर डोरेस्लेट सीरीज मे बी दैट आई हिट अपॉन नेक्स्ट टाइम ट्वेंटी मिनट ओवर ओके लेट्स स्टॉप हियर सो गो थ्रू ऑल दीज सीरीज फॉर योर सेल्फ ओके and if it would be really great if you try to prove them because then you'll have confidence and you know it'll stay in your memory also all of these you have already seen yes yeah. try to work with these and see how far you can go with your prior knowledge and then next lecture we will uh, see the dirichlet series and just a very quick review of the rishlet series and then we'll shift to a new topic okay okay yeah so um this recording i will again share online okay. on the youtube so if at all you have missed out anything we can uh, you can see there and saham we will discuss about the issue you were having Oh no, ma'am. I uh, figured it out. Uh, I was considering that uh, all points within the uh, all points outside the radius of convergent uh, at those uh, three dispersion points. Uh, okay. Okay. Great. So um, then nothing is due apart from your assigning grading, and uh, so November sometime we'll have our quiz also. Okay. So just one week prior, I would announce, but I am giving you. the month that november we'll have our quiz okay pretty much in the mid of november okay okay yeah okay so thanks